Welcome back everyone to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today I'll be talking about the 2021 version of Candyman. All right, the new Candyman. It was directed by Nia DaCosta, and it is supposed to be a direct sequel from the original Candyman. Now, there were three, I believe, uh, but this one is ignoring the second and third one, so I've read. And something I'm going to be talking about later in this podcast is, can this new Candyman act as its own movie? Do you need to see the first one? So the first thing I'm going to start off with has to do with the story. There's two things that I noted. So the first thing is that they're trying to make the Candyman name live on through this famous artist who's the main character, Anthony, because if they don't, the Candyman name will likely be forgotten, much like the Cabrini Green neighborhood that is being gentrified. This movie kind of blurs the lines of whether or not Candyman is a good guy with bad intentions or a bad guy with good intentions. You're kind of unclear on that. And I, I've deduced that I think that Candyman is killing people who don't take his name seriously and the stories about it, or those who are guilty at the time of his name being said. All right, now I'm going to jump into some of the symbolism that I saw in this movie. Now, this first one, my wife pointed out to me, it's that all of the bees kind of represent that Candyman is a hive mind. So Candyman is multiple people with multiple experiences that are all centered around racial injustice. And, you know, in there they say that Candyman is a hive mind. But for some reason, I didn't put two and two together when there's tons of bees swarming Candyman's face. All right. And then this next one, I could be pulling symbolism out of thin air. They might not have intended this, but there's a part where Anthony is walking up to a mirror and the camera is focused on Anthony and not the reflection in the mirror. And to me, that was giving off symbolism that the reflection is focusing on Anthony. And that would go to show you how just the way you compose your shots, the way you are using your camera and focus can tell a story in itself. All right, and then the other thing that I noted was there's a shot where they're in an art gallery and there's a piece of art on the wall, so it's a neon sign and then a couple figures and the sign says you're obviously in the wrong place and the S-L-Y and obviously and the P-L in place are flickering. And now I was looking that up because I was like, that's got to mean something. And first of all, it's a real artwork. I'd never heard of it before, but it was created by Virgil Abloh, if I'm pronouncing his last name right. I'm sorry if I'm not. And so it's a quote from the movie Pretty Woman. But when I was looking it up, you know, it was drawing the connections between that is probably how a lot of black people have felt in this country is that feeling like you're obviously in the wrong place. And I couldn't find out why those specific letters were flickering. If you know, and if you found the resource online that says where, like I would love to know because I, I couldn't even find an article about the artist talking about it where it said why those are flickering, which is driving me nuts because it's gotta mean something. And I love symbolism. So that kind of irritated me that I couldn't figure that out. All right, and then we're going to move on to some fun facts and I got these from IMDb. So I didn't notice this at first because we were kind of scrambling to get into the movies, but the production companies when they're being showed on screen are all reversed apparently. And so that's to make it seem like you're looking in a mirror, seeing reflection. So that's super cool. Nice attention to detail there. And now I had originally made a note of how cool the opening shot of Chicago was where the camera seems like they're driving on a car and the camera is looking up at the buildings and kind of tilted back a little bit. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool look. I've never seen a city shot quite that way. And in the IMDb fun facts trivia thing, it was saying that the original Candyman had a shot that was from above Chicago looking down. And this one, they were paying tribute by kind of doing the opposite. Another fun fact that I read was that apparently Jordan Peele was supposed to be the director, but then they ended up going with Nia DaCosta. And I'm not sure what kind of like logistics or maybe politics that went into that, but Jordan Peele was still on as one of the writers and as one of the producers. And that's what initially caught my eye with this movie is anything with Jordan Peele's name on it, I'm going to go see it because he is one of my favorite directors of all time. Another fun fact, Lakeith Stanfield, who was in Get Out, Judas the Black Messiah, and uh, he's in Atlanta. He's in a bunch of 
different things. You've probably seen him if you don't know him by name. Uh, he was apparently supposed to be casted as the main character, Anthony, but he took the role of Judas the Black Messiah. I really liked uh, whatever the actor's name is who played Anthony, um, but I also really love Lakeith Stanfield, but I think it would have been just as good with either of them. And this isn't a fun fact as much as it's just ironic. Uh, that movie centers a lot around gentrification and the neighborhood that we saw that movie in is in the process of being gentrified. My wife pointed that out to me and I was like, yeah, that is ironic. All right, now moving on to the VFX. First of all, those shadow animations that they use during the movie and after the movie are top notch. Very cool. I don't know if they're actually doing these shadow animations you know physically or if they are creating them in a computer and editing them uh, regardless of however it is it looks very time consuming and i definitely respect the patience that it would take to make that and to tell a story through these shadows i talked about this in the first episode of psycho cinematic but i love when a camera shoots directly at a mirror or something with a reflection and you can't see the camera that is always so cool to me and i was blown away in this one because he's in a uh elevator just with all these mirrors and you know there's no camera to be seen at all um, but what i wish i had been looking for at the time was whether or not there was camera movement because now i can't remember and that movie's still in theaters so i can't go back and double check so, but i mean regardless even if it's stationary that's cool it's more simple to do but i just love that they can do that and you know it makes it feel like you're there and it's not a movie anymore also another cg there's a part where anthony is in the mirror and he sees himself as Candyman, and they have what looks like a completely 3D CG candy man that's just, you know, replicating his movements, but he looks kind of like a video game character, like just a little bit, a little plasticky. Like I, I read that they used the original Candyman actor and gave him some digital de-aging, which would naturally probably soften your face a little bit. But this one, just based on the way it moved, I'm guessing was completely 3D. All right, before we move into if it's a standalone movie, I have one thing to say that I don't think fits into any category, but the scene where the uh, art exhibit director or whatever, and then that one woman are getting a little hot and heavy and she dies, his reaction was so weird. I was like, this does not seem like a legitimate reaction. I mean, she literally gets murdered right in front of him and just blood shooting out everywhere and she's got like a slit throat and he's like, is this for real? But it took him a while and you know, my wife was saying that maybe he's just one of the uh, the freeze people instead of fight or flight, he's just a freeze person. It's like, yeah, maybe. But I was just like, that was such a weird reaction. <laughs> Now, is Candyman a standalone movie? If you couldn't get it from what I was saying before, I haven't seen the original Candyman, and I would say that yes, this movie does work as a standalone for the most part. There are three things that I was confused about, and only one of them do I think has to actually do with the original Candyman. The other two, I'm just not sure, but I'll get into those right now. All right, so the first part I've heard is a part of the original Candyman, and that's the whole story of the woman with the baby who turns out to be Anthony. I didn't quite understand that whole part but i'm sure if i go and watch the original candy man i will all right the other thing was with the laundromat guy because he turned out to be you know a part of it but i'm just confused as to like how he got involved because he's trying to keep the candy man name alive but i don't understand because he doesn't seem like he's a part of the candy man hive i'd be curious to hear your guys' explanations about that laundromat guy down in the comments if you know all right, and then the other thing that doesn't quite make sense is why they incorporated Brianna's dad's suicide. Because they made it kind of seem like it was going to be a bigger thing in the movie, and it really wasn't from what I gathered. It seems like they could have just never mentioned that at all, and the movie would have been the exact same. So... I don't know about that either. All right, now we're gonna get into my rating of this movie and then Rotten Tomatoes' is rating. So I would rate this movie a seven out of 10. And there's really just two reasons that I wasn't as crazy about this movie as I wanted to be. The first reason is I just wish it was scarier. I didn't jump once in there and I just didn't feel like it was that scary of a movie. I know it's kind of slashery and those typically aren't the scariest movies, but at least like, jump scares are in there. I was kind of 
disappointed in that aspect. And the second thing is strictly from the movie critic part of me. And that was the delivery of the message and meaning which centered around racial injustice. I was sitting around wondering why it didn't come off as good to me as some of Jordan Peele's other work. Now granted, Jordan Peele in Get Out and Us directed, wrote, and produced. And then in this one, he was just one writer and one producer, so he probably had a lot less say. But let me explain. Get Out also had a message and commentary on racism in America. The difference that I deduced was that Get Out had me guessing the entire movie as to what the Armitage family was doing to these black people that were brought there. I wasn't sure if it was some form of slavery, brainwashing, or cult activity, and it turned out to be none of those things. And the entire movie is riddled with symbolism, foreshadowing, and deeper meanings, and I love that. Now, I could definitely hear the argument that they might not have wanted the viewer to have to dig that deep to find the hidden meanings, and they wanted their message to be as clear as possible. And I can totally respect that. But for me, I like the thrillers that make me think really hard and stay vigilant for symbolism because I find them to be the most memorable, exciting, and engaging. Now, with that being said, I'll wrap it up with the Rotten Tomatoes. The critics gave it 85% and the audience gave it 73%. So pretty close to what I ranked it as well. I hope you guys enjoyed the psycho cinematic episode if you did leave me a thumbs up comment what you thought down below and then subscribe if you haven't already i'll see you in the next one